at Georgia State University. The library at Georgia State includes the Special Collections Department and the Southern Labor Archives as part of that Special Collections Department. Uh, this oral history project is under the direction of the Labor Archivist at Georgia State University, Lauren Cada. Uh, my name is Philip Laporte. I am Director of the Labor Studies Program at Georgia State University and I will be conducting the interview today of Mr. Herb Green. Uh, today is Wednesday, January the 18th, 2006. Uh, the interview is being conducted at the United Auto Workers uh, Local 10 Union Hall, located on Buford Highway in Doraville, Georgia. Uh, with me today is Mr. Herb Green. Uh, he is a retired uh, UAW International Representative. Uh, uh, Mr. Green, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Herb, uh, Herb Green, um, could you tell me, please, uh, where were you born and the the year you were born? I was born, the address was Norcross, Georgia. The exact place was approximately halfway between Norcross and Dorval. The year and day was July 6, 1921. And can you tell me about your parents, Herb? Uh, a little bit about your mom and dad. Yes, my mother's name was Velma Corley before she married Creighton Green. They both were born on farms. Here, my Grandpa Green, my father's father, he accumulated approximately 400 acres of land. He, he and my grandmother had 13 children, nine boys, and four girls. My mother's uh, father had uh, 60 acres of land and they had 12 children. Uh, they had, uh, I believe I'm right, nine girls and three boys, but not any of the boys lived to be grown. They, all three boys died as infants. And your family, uh, Herb, how many uh, siblings did you have? I have two, a boy and a girl the girl, the oldest. And so you grew up uh, in uh, Norcross, Georgia um, and Doraville, so between what is now, or of course what is, Gwinnett County and DeKalb County. A little community called Mechanicsville. And can you tell us uh, about your uh, working career, uh, the first uh, jobs you had um, when you first began uh, working for a living? Yes. My father went to work for Ford Motor Company when Ford was located on Ponce de Leon next to Sears and Roba. Sears used to have a place where they had a catalog you could order out of this catalog and it was on, I don't know the number of the street, but it was 
constantly on Atlanta, and the Ford Motor Company was adjacent to Sears and Roebuck, and this was where they assembled the T models and A models. My father and three of his brothers worked at that Ford plant. They closed the Ford plant during the Depression, and they offered my father a job if he would move to Cincinnati, Ohio. He accepted the job, but he didn't move my mother and us three children to Ohio. So we we uh, continued to live here with one of my mother's sister in Buckhead. So my father got to be an alcoholic. I'm sorry to have to say this, but he he really got to be bad with alcoholics. And uh, he came back years later and finally stopped drinking, which was very good. But it was years later. My mother had some serious illness and back in those days, uh, we we had no money, and she had to have some surgery. They was a country doctor in Norcross, Dr. King. He arranged for surgery at St. Joseph Hospital which was located on uh, downtown at, uh, uh, well. Mm -hmm. I think back then it was uh, called St. Joseph's Infirmary. Yeah, and it was on the street that's still there mm -hmm. where the Hilton Hotel is on downtown. Cortland Street. Cortland mm -hmm. Street was mm -hmm. where St. Joseph was at that time. Mm -hmm. They took my mother, did the surgery, knowing we didn't have money to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. I've always had a real soft spot in my heart for St. Joseph. So I went to work for a drug store. I don't know, Philip, if you ever heard the curb boys at drugstore. But back then, most Lane's drugstore, Jacobs, and Wendell and Roberts, which was independent, they had curb boys. A car would drive in, I would go out and take their order, go in and get at the soda found, get the oil filled, and take it back to the car. I was so small at that time, I'd have to stand on my tiptoes to fasten this tray to the car. So I did that for, I believe it was two years. Then, Later, and I believe it was about 1934, 35, could have been 36, we moved back in the house with my grandparents. And at that time, one of my mother's sisters was living with my grandparents. She had never been married. 
she never did marry. And she was like a second mother to us children. So we lived there. And I worked on the farm. Worked with my grandpa Green. Had a son that broke his leg. And he needed a farm hand. And I was a teenage boy. And I worked and lived with my grandfather Green for one year. So, Herb, you were a car hop uh, at the, or curb boy uh, for the drugstore. And by my calculations, you were 13 and 14 years old those two years. Is yeah, I, I believe I started uh, some younger around 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. They didn't pay you any money for working. The only money you got was what tips. <laughs> and those tips came very slow, very slow. I can remember, Philip, I got a dollar and a quarter one night. And I ran all the way home. <laughs> Man, I was afraid I'd, I'd get robbed. You know, back in those days, grown men were working for a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. Especially here in the South. They just wasn't in the manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And all part of it. So, uh, then you went to work on the farm as a farmhand. Uh, and what about your schooling, Herb? Did you attend public schools in Norcross up to a certain age? Well, we had a little one and two room. They finally made two rooms out of this one large room, and it was called Mechanicsville. I went to school there three years, and uh, we we had no plumbing in this building. We had no electricity. And the boys, teenage boys like myself, would build fires in the pot bellied stove. And it was a, a real nice spring with nice clear water that we got our drinking water. And we had a bucket. We boys would rotate getting water from the spring. And we did have a cooler <laughs> with, there wasn't any ice <laughs> for it, but we had this, it was a cooler, uh, I call it a rock, uh, made out of rock like, and we take the bucket, get the the water from the cooler, take it to the schoolhouse, and pour it out from the bucket into the cooler, and then it's dispense it to the drinking. Mm -hmm. okay. And no, no facility. But you know, we had a teacher that really, she was concerned enough about her students. I was probably should have been more concerned myself. I was working in the field trying to make a little money because I needed some clothes. And she thought I needed to be in school. She went to see my mother and asked her why I wasn't in school. And my mother told her, I think, and I 
I'm pretty sure he's at the neighbor's house plowing today to make some money. They came and got me out of the field and took me to the school. <laughs> and so I went. Yes, sir. I, I, I felt that since she came and got me, it was better I to go to school than to, you know, to even put up a disagreement. Mm -hmm. And do you remember how old you were when the teacher came and got you out of the field to take you to school? I was around 12 years old, maybe 13. I wasn't over 13. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Herb Green, you, um, born in 1921, and so by uh, 1941, you were 20 years old uh, when uh, World War II began uh, for the United States. Uh, of course, you were 18 when war broke out in Europe. Uh, so those teenage years, you were in school from the field at 13, uh, and then um, five years later, you would have been 18 and war would have broken out. Do you remember those years between yes. 13 and 18 uh, in school, working? I worked at a, you know, back then, several small dairies, in fact, there was a small dairy where the General Motors plant is now. A lady by the name of Miss Misery Della Maloney, she, I would say she had probably 15 cows there. And she ran a small little dairy. She would take fresh milk into the places like Buckhead, Brookhaven, and into the city of Atlanta uh, to customers she had. And, and sometime in the early 40s, she sold that property, or, or maybe she sold it to some real estate, but it was sold for the General Motors property. But I, w I worked at a little dairy, the name of it was Sunrise. And I, I stayed with the people. I had my room and board. And the family treated me just, they had three boys and one girl. And I worked seven days a week for seven dollars a week. And my my board. And how old were you then, Herb? I was uh, probably 13, 14, 15. I worked at one up up there in, uh, during this month. They, they was quite a few of these small dairies. That was, other than farming and sawmill work, small dairies was about all. I did work in a high quality shoe factory just prior to going to work for uh, It was packing house, 
Swift and Company. This was a branch of Swift and Company where they slaughtered cows and, and pigs. I was working there when I was inducted into service. And where was that um, packing house, the slaughterhouse that was a division of Swift and Company? Do you remember where it was located, Her? Yeah. It's, it's where the Atlantic Steel back there and the water works in that area. What's the them streets, they they really doing some uh, over all work in there. Now, right, that's 14th Street. <coughs> yeah. 14th and Ponders Avenue. I forget several streets, but they, mm -hmm. I know there's uh, Wachovia Bank is building a big, high building there. Yes. Uh, and do you remember the job you had uh, at the packing house? Yes, I do. I worked in the box room. The boxes came all broken down. And I, I put them together by stapling them together. I'd put them on this car and take them to the various, various locations, to the different places where they packed the meat. And so uh, it was boxed beef uh, or boxed uh, other type of uh, meat products and you distributed the boxes that were used to pack the meat. Right. And do you remember what you got paid for doing that work? Yeah, I thought I really was really making good money. Fifteen dollars a week was my top pay. I started at twelve dollars a week. But when I got the top pay, was fifteen dollars. I might tell you a little story about that. We had one man that did all the hiring and firing and he didn't he didn't like city boards. If he thought you was raised in the city, he wouldn't hire you there. So he had a few can questions like he had a clipboard, something like you got there. And you'd go in and he'd say, Boy, called you boy. I don't care how. Say, Boy, what's your name? You tell him. That's what when you was trying to get a job. You tell him you know. He'd say, Boy, where, where are you part today? You tell him where you parked. If you parked in a bad place, he didn't like that. He wants you to park like Then he'd say, Boy, how old are you? You tell him that. And he'd say, Boy, how much you weigh? You give him the weight. The last thing he would ask you, Boy, where do you live? So the word got out that you don't tell him you live in town. You tell him you live in the country. So this fellow was really wanted a job, so he said, got through the question to the last one. He says, now, boy, where do you live? He said, I live in Tucker. But I don't live right sock up in Tucker. <laughs> he, he didn't want him to think he lived in Tucker. But that was when 
not saying they had Tucker, but Kofer brothers. Right. You know? So he didn't live right suck up in Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, how old were you, Herb, uh, when you were working there at the packing house? I was, when I first went to work there, I was 19 and 20. Maybe. Maybe I. I probably turned 21 before. And was there any presence uh, of uh, unions uh, at the packing house or any attempt by the workers to organize at the packing house? Yeah. Before I went to work there, I did work at a shoe factory. Mm -hmm. And we was going to organize and they closed the plant. It was high quality shoe factory on Whitehall Street. And I only worked there, I would say about six or eight months. And some of the people had some experience from Boney Allen in Buford and they had got fired for wanting a union, so they was going to uh, get a union there at high quality. And I was all for it. I knew my daddy how hard he had to work at Ford, and they was trying union. So I was riding in with the group. And Kenny Baum was the people's name that ran that shoe factory. And they says, now, boys, if y'all get a union here, we'll close this plant. But uh, we didn't get the union, but they closed the plant before we could. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And so then you went to work at the packing house, right? Uh, and you said that there was uh, an effort to uh, organize on the part yeah, of the workers. See, it was uh, a branch of a Swiftman company, and they were organized up north in some of the places. I'm trying to think of the white provision was the name of the place. And it was right in there, around 14th and 15th, and the water works was right in that area. But the name of the business was White Provision, a branch of Swift and Company. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh -oh. You know, sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night, I can't think of that, and I'll think of it, think of it. Sure. <laughs> you ever do that? You, you might not think of it. Yes. Of course, you, you're not, I won't ask you your age, because <laughs> you, you're a lot younger than I am. Yes, sir. Uh, so you uh, were describing how some of the workers at White Provision on uh, um, 14th Street by the Atlanta Waterworks uh, were uh, attempting to organize. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, those efforts? Yeah, what we, you know, at lunchtime we would maybe gather early Maybe if we went to work at 7.30, we'd try to get there 30 minutes or 45 minutes early. And we'd talk about why, you know, why are the people in Chicago at, why should they be paid more? than we are. We, we, we have to pay as much 
for a loaf of bread is right there. And we, there, and we would say, oh, they'll tell us they'll close this plant and they'll do this, but are we willing to take a chance to, you know, you know, I, 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 I would, I would say now when I look back on some of the places that closed, like that shoe factory, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. If they hadn't, I might have still been there mm -hmm. trying, trying to make a living. What we did, we worked piecework. I do. My job was tacking the insole at that shoe factory. When I do a dozen pair of shoes, I clip off this ticket, and I turn them in, say, like on a Wednesday, and that's what I get paid for on Friday. If I lost the ticket, I didn't get no pay. If if something happened to the machinery and slowed me down, that was tough luck for me. So that's, you know, a lot of people don't understand unions. All they know it's what they read in the paper and what they hear on TV. Ninety percent of the strikes that we have is not about wages. So I I would hope some day we would be judged on really what we strike about and what the union products, the fin finished product is, is, is what, what value it really is. Mm -hmm. And so the workers at White Provision uh, discussing the cost of uh, food, a loaf of bread, uh, housing, clothing, uh, believe that they should be paid the same rate as uh, workers in Chicago at the Swift Company. Right. And then there was an effort to try to organize workers there at the Atlanta facility. Yeah. And what did that lead to, Herb? Well, see, I went in service back in 1942 and when I came back uh, from service they had uh, built General Motors or started General Motors. Uh, it wasn't. They didn't. The first car I think was run 1947. I'm sure that's when the first car. But back then, uh, I don't believe uh, we got them organized there at White Division. I think it, you know, people. And those those people that was in management was no different. They give raises and they they would do better to the employees to keep the unions out. And they they really do a good job in most cases of keeping them out like they did up at Hartwell, Georgia. <laughs> I'm sure you remember some things about Hartwell. 
when we was trying to organize the Shotgun's Order plan. Mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. they promised you a lot of things and uh, some of them things never happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you were uh, drafted into, was it the U.S. Army? Yeah, Air Corps. U.S. Army Air Corps. How I got in the Air Corps, uh, God only knows, but I'm sure proud I did. Mm -hmm. You know, like I say, I'd never been from Nalcross or Dorval. I'd never been any further from home than Atlanta when I went in service. So they I can't remember how I got from where I lived to Lawrenceville. That was the county seat of when they carried me. But they took us from Lawrenceville to Fort McPherson and we got our, our shots and things. But, you know, the Army or the government always does things that seem wrong. They took me on Friday and he took a bus load from Lawrenceville to Fort Madden. They gave us some shots and they got on the PA system and said, any of you that lives near enough and can be back uh, Monday morning can get a weekend pass. Here they are taking us on Friday. So naturally, I rush up there and get me a weekend pass. That's when I had, I believe it was what we call uh, trackless trolleys. You you remember? Yeah. I get on a trolley and go to Ogathorpe. That was as far as they go north, and I hitchhiked on home. My mother, <laughs> we had a long driveway going up to my grandfather's house. So my mother saw me walking up that drive and she met me. <laughs> and she says, what are you doing coming back? I said, mother, they treat you like dogs. Now, I'm, I just climbed the fence and left. I'm not. I'm gonna hide out over here, and you and my sister was named Dot. I said y'all can bring me food over there, and I'm gonna hide out. She said, "Young man, you're not gonna embarrass this family. You you march yourself back down there." So then I had to tell her, you know, I had to. We can pass, <laughs> so I did. But there I was, you know, had to go back. I had to hitchhike Monday morning and go back. Mm -hmm. So I was there. I believe I was there the rest of the week. They put us on a troop train. You know where I ended up? Atlantic City, New Jersey and living in one of the hotels while we got our drill, drill right out on the boardwalk. I tell you, this is <laughs> no black sitting here. We, I, told, I used to tell those Yankees, I said, you know, we pulled in here on that troop train I looked out the window. I saw this big black policeman. I said, my Lord, they done shipped me to Africa. <laughs> I said, how did I get to Africa without getting on the water? 
I've never seen a blind policeman. I've never been. <laughs> man, they, they have no blind policemen. You know what they do from there on? No, they, they always called you by your last name. They say, Green, come over. Tell us about the trip you made to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the Army Air Corps took over all those hotels right there on the boardwalk, and we drilled. Mm -hmm. right there. Yeah. Uh, the, the first black police officers in Atlanta, there were eight uh, black police officers, uh, and they were restricted uh, to patrolling Auburn Avenue. Yeah. And uh, it, it was revolutionary at the time, uh, but that uh, was uh, through the lobbying uh, of Maynard Jackson's uh, grandfather, yeah. uh, called the, the Grand, uh, John Wesley Dobbs. Uh, so, uh, growing what, up in... What year was that? Uh, testing my memory, it is recorded in the book where uh, uh, Peachtree meets Sweet Auburn. Uh, uh, but I, I believe uh, it was in either the late 1930s or early 1940s, yeah. but that was restricted to Atlanta and restricted to Auburn Avenue. And yeah. so uh, uh, black police officers uh, were not uh, uh, <laughs> patrolling the streets in, in Gwinnett County and Lawrenceville or Norcross or anywhere. <laughs> That's right. So it would have been a... A new experience for you in 1942 right. uh, to see African American uh, police officers in the state of New Jersey. Right. Yes. Yes. So you uh, drilled uh, on the boardwalk uh, in Atlantic City. Right. Uh, and the Miss America pageant was not being held at that time. <laughs> correct. Uh, so then uh, you spent uh, how many years uh, in the U.S. Army Air Corps? Three years. Six months and 21 days. <laughs> and what year uh, were you discharged? Uh, from 46. The and um, any, do you remember anything in particular about your uh, years of service there? It was the height of World War II, of course. Yeah. Uh, I serviced Bell, the bomber. That bomb, uh, Hiroshima, mm -hmm. it stopped at Okinawa. Okinawa. I was stationed at Okinawa and we serviced the plant. And the war ended while I was on Okinawa. And myself and two other friends were riding in a jeep one Sunday morning. We just, we hadn't been able during the war to see much of Okinawa. We had to stay close and stay down most of the time. And we were up on this, what to call a turnaround. And this ton and a half truck hit us yeah, and killed the, the soldier that was driving the Jeep. I was in the middle, and the fellow on the right hand side of me broke his hip. And, Felt him up and not it broke my shoulder and and uh, like I say killed the fella that was driving. We went through through the war and none of the three of us was injured and here one got killed and and the other two of us got injured so. And that was a real tragedy, you know. So they, we had to stay there in Okinawa 
for a while, and then went to Japan. They froze us till we got a replacement. Mm -hmm. no, so you were there in Japan uh, at the end of the war, uh, which had been August of 1945. Well, I, I was on Okinawa yes. at the end, I see. but they shipped me on into Japan. So you so, were part of the occupying force, right. the U.S. Army occupying force in right. Japan after the Japanese had unconditionally surrendered right. to General Douglas MacArthur. Right. I, I, I feel that was a benefit to be now. I really wanted to go home and not go into Japan. But since it happened like it did, it, it gave me the opportunity to go into Japan. I'm, well, I've been to Japan since then, but uh, I, I don't know if I would have got to go. Mm -hmm. And you then uh, shipped back uh, to the United States. Uh, and do you recall where you were discharged uh, from the Army? At Fort McPherson. Back to Fort McPherson. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, where you had arrived originally by bus and then departed by trolley and hitchhiking. Right. Uh, and so you returned and you were, you were discharged, uh, came back uh, to Atlanta. Right. And that was 1946? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, to Atlanta and went back to uh, Fort McPherson um, by the airport here in Atlanta. And that's where you were discharged from the U.S. Army, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then, then uh, as I understand it, uh, you service the Angola Gay, uh, the, the plane that uh, dropped the atomic bomb um, in Japan, either at Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Uh, and uh, I understand that uh, uh, your future wife was working at the Bell Bomber plant, which is now the uh, Lockheed Martin uh, facility in Marietta that builds the C-130J and the F-22 fighter aircraft, uh, that she worked on that plane, you serviced the plane, mm -hmm. and it became uh, the uh, plane uh, that uh, dropped the A-bomb that, in effect, ended the uh, Japanese resistance uh, and brought about an end to World War II. Yeah, that's right. It, it's amazing how things came about by her working there at Bell Bummer on this plane and me uh, being in service station there and servicing the plane and then she and I getting married. <laughs> <laughs> well, ironies uh, are uh, rich in life, aren't they? Sure are. So uh, back to Fort McPherson, and you were discharged uh, from uh, the U.S. Army Air Corps. And then uh, what did you do once you left uh, the Army, once you had been discharged? Well, I went to work for Crane Heating Company in uh, working uh, on furnace, installing furnaces and air conditioning units. And I worked there until I went to work for General Motors. Went to work for General Motors in 1949, January 1949. And how did you come uh, to go to work for General Motors? Uh, well, General Motors being right close to where I lived and grew up 
and my father working at Ford and realizing that the automobile assembly plants pay a sizable increase in salaries, especially in this uh, part of the country in the South, I felt they might be a better opportunity to improve you know, your financial um, status here. And it has often been said that the best paying uh, jobs uh, available to a, a wage earner, a working person, an hourly employee, are in the automobile industry. Uh, some would say that is still true today. Uh, that was the case for you in 1949 when you went to work for General Motors? Yeah, it, it was the case back then and I believe still is. So, do you recall what you were earning uh, on a weekly basis at Crane Heating uh, versus what your earnings were at General Motors? Approximately. I was at Crane, I was earning approximately uh, Sixty, sixty dollars a week. This is uh, including uh, uh, the friends benefits, which was very few. But General Motors was I would say about a third more than I would make at the heat and crane heat. So if your annual wages at, at Crane were approximately $3,000 a year in uh, 1947 and General Motors uh, you would earn uh, a third more and that would be approximately $4,000 per year. Does that sound accurate? I would say that would be about as accurate as I can remember. Mm -hmm. right. And so you applied for a job at General Motors, you recall you had a, a father work, that worked at Ford yeah. and three uncles that worked at Ford. Right. So there was a history in your family of working in the automobile industry. Yeah. And so um, you applied for a job and can you tell us about uh, going to work for General Motors? Uh, did you get uh, questions about where you lived and how much you weighed, etc., or was it different? Yeah, I got it the questions, but it was quite different. You had a written question here at the uh, packing house before I went in service. They, they didn't have any written questions. They just uh, did it all all orally, mm -hmm. but this was written. You had to fill out a question there. Mm -hmm. And I filled it out, and to the best of my memory, approximately one week later, after making application for employment, I was called to come to work. 
And do you remember what your first job was at General Motors? Yes. My first job, I was assigned to the body shop. And it was in removing what we call the gates, which was made out of iron that held the body together while they were being welded. And when the body reached me on this assembly line, I would remove one side of the gates where the body could process on to to be further uh, further down the line further processed up the line or mm -hmm. below the line mm -hmm. right and uh, do you remember how many people were employed at the General Motors assembly plant in Doraville when you first came there in 1949? Yeah, it was only, I would say, we were running a small amount of cars per hour then. I would say less than 15 per hour, maybe, maybe 10 jobs per hour. Mm -hmm. right. and, and at the time I left General Motors to go on the staff, we were averaging approximately one car per minute, 60 cars per hour. <coughs> we may not want that at this time in, in the interview. In, yes. I don't know. Yes. May want to. Uh, I, I, the number of people that were employed, we know today in 2006 that there are approximately uh, 3,200 uh, employees at the General Motors Doraville plant. Right. In 1949, when you started, do you remember how many people were employed uh, at the General Motors Doraville plant? I would say... Probably maybe five to seven hundred. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, Herb, when you came to work there in nineteen forty nine, uh, did the UAW already represent? workers at GM Doraville? Had the union yeah. established its presence there already? Yeah. And so a contract uh, was in place. Yeah. And how were you uh, introduced uh, to the UAW when you came to work at General Motors in 1949? Well, I had heard, you know, how things travel, especially they, the, I first heard that you cannot join the union until you're there for 90 days. Well, that was just, you know, talk because you can join the first day if you want to. So, but I, I had heard this. So, 
I started to inquire, not about the union, because I knew what my dad and his brothers had went through at Ford, because Ford, you know, was the last group of employees after GM uh, to join the union. So I was anxious to find out just if they was in the set time. And when I found out, I joined. And uh, then I found out what you, you needed to do to get to be a commitment, alternate commitment, or what you needed to qualify. So I found that out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Uh huh, uh huh, all right. And so uh, you came to work and found out that you could join the, the union right away. You didn't have to wait for this 90-day period. Right. And you said you joined right away and uh, took to it quickly in terms of uh, finding out what you needed to qualify to be a committeeman. Right. Uh, and so do you recall uh, your committeeman? And were you invited to join the union by committeemen in the area you worked? Yeah, I, I uh, first was uh, invited to run, and I was uh, elected as alternate committee. And I served as an alternate committee for uh, a short period of time which was approximately one year. And do you remember when that was, Herb? You were elected as the alternate committeeman. It was in sometime in 1950. Uh -huh. I believe it was towards the end of 1950. Mm -hmm. So you had worked at the plant for a year or 18 months, <coughs> right. uh, and then you were elected uh, as an alternate committeeman. Right. And you served in that office for a year's time? Yeah. What happened, the committee was laid off for what they accused him of doing was causing a wild cat strike what was they accused him of leading some people out on and they laid him I believe he got a, I can't remember but it's on record I believe here at the local how much layoff he got uh, and was charged with uh, uh, causing a unauthorized uh, strike or some, some set out or something in the body shop. R. L. Stephen, you remember? Stephen, it's he he died this past year. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, a good commitment. And so he, you said he was laid off. Uh, uh, did the um, the company actually suspend him and charged him with causing an unauthorized uh, strike? Um, sit down, as you say, in the body shop, and uh, Mr. Stevens uh, was suspended from work um, for perhaps 30 days? 
I believe so. Mine's not real clear on that, but I took over while he was out. And so you went from being the alternate committeeman to being the the committeeman for that period of time that Mr. Stevens was out. Right. I see. And so uh, you took over his duties. And can you remember um, some of those duties, some of those things you did as committeeman? Oh, yeah. Uh, Back then, they wasn't in the full parent. Commitment. So you had to, they allowed you so many, so much time a week. And if you ran out of time, that time in one day, you just didn't have any more time for the rest of the uh, week or month. Or Whatever. My memory is not well enough to remember just what it was, but uh, I'm sure there's a record here. I I used to wanna when when they when a form, foreman would have an employee who wanted me as their commitment. I ma- I made sure. They didn't charge me more time than I used, so my time wouldn't be used, you know, and me not using it. So we had to watch it real close because them foreman would charge you for time you didn't use. Right. Yes, um, many contracts even today uh, restrict the amount of time that a working committeeman or a uh, working job steward uh, uh, can devote to uh, union business. Uh, right. And uh, when you first uh, worked as a committeeman, uh, as a UAW representative, that was uh, the provision in the contract. That's that right. You were restricted uh, in the amount of time that you could conduct union business. And they didn't let you go over. <laughs> One minute it was up, you you went back on your job, and my job was metal finish. And so, did you receive any training uh, before you assumed the duties of committeemen on the provisions of the collective bargaining agreement? Well, the only training I received was from. R. R. L. Stevens, Steve, I called him, Big Steve, and I, I would talk with him, and we had a, our first uh, union hall was here in Dorval at the back of a feed store. They had a feed store here in Dorval and we had a little I would say a space about half this size behind it was inside but it was at the back of the feed store. So you're describing a size of approximately 10 feet by 5 feet. Right. 50 square feet at the back of a feed store. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> and the the people that owned and ran the feed store was union minded enough to let us use that. And Martha Henderson, whom you probably knew before she retired, she was our secretary of that. Yes, Martha Henderson had over 50 years service right. to this local union. Right. Yes, uh, she had the institutional memory of Local 10 in Doraville, yes. Right. Uh, but I, I did not know that Martha Henderson started her career 
in the back of a feed store in Doraville yeah. as yeah. her service as secretary of UAW Local 10. Yeah. Uh, and so as a committeeman, uh, you represented workers, uh, you adjusted grievances. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me some of your experiences in that role uh, as a committeeman? Yeah, I remember right well, and I, I'm pretty sure it was the Pony Act that <clears throat> had the large trunk, we call it the deck lid, and the deck lid had to be hoisted, or not hoist, it's not a word I want to use right here, had to be manhandled off of the uh, uh, line. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a feeder feeder line mm -hmm. to the assembly line to go on the deck of the car. Mm -hmm. And it had got so large I felt that it was too large for one person to handle. And under the contract, we have paragraph 78. I'll never forget paragraph 78, which dealt with overload. We, it prohibited management from assignment overload. So, I wrote a grievance. On this, I had had this fella. He was having to take this deck lid, what we call them, deck lid, off of that partial line, that feeder line, off of that, over to the main, fastenate on to the main. So I wrote. The man, management people were telling me, said, Herbie's got plenty of time to do that. I said, I'm not talking about time. The man is really ruining his health. He'll never live long enough to draw his pension. And I want some help on getting the 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 deck lid off over on we seventy eight paragraph seventy eight don't apply. He's got plenty of time. I told you I'm not talking about time. I'm talking about the energy he has to put for. So <laughs> I came in one morning. They had this great big guy. Now, <laughs> he must have been about six foot two or three with hands, you know, great big hands as big as a horse's hoop. Had him a son. I said, look, you're not going to beat my grievance by Hiring a giant, that's the words I use. You, you done hired a giant, trying, and the grievance is on the job, not on the man. So uh, they finally put in a hoist that had, had suction uh, cups on it, and they take the hoist over put it on, get the deck clean, and take it on with and put it on. So that's the way we had And so your grievance led to the job being re-engineered yeah. 
uh, to diminish the weight uh, and stress uh, that an individual worker uh, was uh, required to it's uh, to lift to, right. to take the deck lid from the feeder line to the assembly line. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, good for you. Uh, and so you mentioned there was a Pontiac. I f I'm pretty. It could have been a, what we call a 98 Olds. Mm -hmm. Back then, I know I, I owned an Olds one time, a 98. And this was either one of the large Pontiacs or 98 Olds. One of them. Do you remember some of the uh, different models uh, that have been assembled here at the Doraville facility? Uh, when I first came, uh, uh, it was uh, the Oldsmobile um, uh, Cutlass uh, and the uh, companion car was the Buick Century. Uh, and I know uh, they've had an Oldsmobile um, uh, Cutlass uh, several different models. Yeah. Uh, it was the Sierra uh, back then. Uh, but um, you remember some of those? You mentioned uh, Olds 98. Yeah. And do you remember some of the other models that you worked on here? Yeah, if I can. Buick. Mm hmm. Or Saber. Or Saber. Yes. Uh, uh, Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. The Pontiac Grand Prix. Grand Prix. Prix. Yeah. Uh, uh, In the 1984, uh, that year, the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme uh, right. was the number one selling uh, nameplate yeah. in America. Right. Uh, it was the best selling car yeah, in the well, United States. And a good looking car. Yes. Yeah. Well, there were Cutlass Clubs uh, all over the United States. Yeah. In fact, former Senator Weish Fowler drove uh, yeah. an Oldsmobile Cutlass. And would not give it up. Uh, when he went to Washington, he took it with him. Uh, and he was, I think, the only member of the United States Senate that was driving a car that was 20 model years old. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that. Uh, Roadmaster. Used to be a Roadmaster. Buick. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, we went from the uh, uh, the Oldsmobile, uh, Cutlass Sierra, and Buick Century uh, to the GM10 model, uh, which was uh, the remodeled Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Uh, and then, uh, following that, uh, if I recall, uh, the Doraville plant uh, uh, got the minivan. Yeah. Uh, it was the second generation of the General Motors minivan. Uh, it was the Chevrolet Venture, the Oldsmobile Silhouette, and uh, there was, um, oh, another model. Oh, uh, of course, the Pontiac uh, Transport originally, but then they sold so many Montanas that they just ended up calling it the Pontiac right. Montana. Right. Uh, and uh, the next generation of that minivan is what currently is being assembled at the Doraville plant. Yeah. So uh, if we can, you know, turn back. Uh, you were a committeeman. Uh, one of your memorable grievances uh, was on uh, paragraph seventy-eight yeah. on the overload. Uh, Another was foreman working. We had, you know, and instead of getting uh, enough hourly workers. These foremen wanting to keep their requests down low for more help, help they would jump in and and when needed they would jump in and help. And 
we would have quite a few grievances uh, wrote or written on foreman work. And so the foremen were restricted uh, from, from doing bargaining unit work, right, correct? Right. And how were you able to resolve those grievances? Well, by hiring, we write a grievance. I would write a grievance as a commitment and have it my personal grievance, but not having adequate manpower, our hourly manpower. And did you then stand for election as a committeeman? Back when I first ran, we'd have to have election each year, every year. And I, I had to be elected every year as long as I was in the plant. For 12 years, I was elected every year. I never was defeated. And were all the elections as committeemen from the body shop? No. Uh, <clears throat> well, from for committeemen was. Then <clears throat> I ran as chairman, and I had to run as plant wide. <coughs> so, do I have it correct, Herb, between 1950 and 1962, uh, you were elected 12 straight years uh, as a committeeman. Yeah. And when were you elected uh, uh, shop committee chair? Well, that was in 1954. So... Part of that 12 years, I was elected the chairman and not the committee. Yeah, okay. All right. And in the UAW's um, organizational structure, chairman of the shop committee uh, is one of the most important jobs uh, in the entire local union. Right. Is the, sh the chairman of the shop committee who knows more about what goes on in the day-to-day -day operations of that plant than anyone else. Right. That's right. More than the president local. The organizational structure has been described as Mr. Inside, the right. chairman of the shop committee, right. and Mr. Outside, the president, president of the local, local union. union. Yeah. Do you think that's a fair description? I do, yeah. And it's been described that the big four are the chairman of the shop committee, the president of the local union, the labor relations director, and the plant manager. Yeah. Now, was that your experience as well? Yeah. And so who was, uh, do you remember some of the uh, general managers uh, that you worked with? as chairman of the shop committee? Yeah. Did you work more with the plant manager or the labor relations director or with both? Labor relations. The very seldom did you, did I, as the chairman of the shop committee, work with the plant manager? Unless she was, you know, about to take a strike vote or go on strike or something, then you would mourn that. If he thought he might prohibit a strike, then he would come in. We, we never had a woman plant manager. I see we're four. It's got woman plant mind. And that's not bad. I'm just mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure a woman can do the job. 
Mm -hmm. Plus the uh, Lakewood General Motors plant, uh, when they had their revitalization, it was a woman who was the plant manager she there. Was. Yes, uh, and that was of course Local Thirty Four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but here at um, Local Ten, uh, General Motors facility, uh, the assembly plant in Doraville. Uh, you served as chairman of the shop committee, and, and how long did you hold that title, Herb? Well, I went. To, I took it in 1954, and then I was appointed to the staff in 1954. That's wrong. I was elected chairman in 1954, and I was appointed to the staff in 1964. So. I was chairman ten years. So an entire decade, uh, probably uh, the greatest growth in, that the American automobile industry experienced in 1954 and 1964. Uh, that was the period, of course, when it was said, what's good for General Motors is good for the country. That was a period that General Motors had over 50% uh, of market share in the United States. Wow. Uh, and during that time period, uh, you were chairman of the shop committee. Wow. Uh, did you see growth uh, at the Doraville assembly plant in terms of uh, number of people that worked here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, uh, at one time... During that time, we had 4,400 hours of work. And that was in the late 50s and early 60s? That was, we, that was prior to 54 just prior to 54 when Eisenhower was elected president. The, when he was, I believe it was the second year he was in his first term. We lost one shift of employee. So this was during his first term. We had the 40, 44. Huh. Okay. All right, so that was uh, 1953, uh, January 1953, Eisenhower took office right. after the election in November of 1952. Uh, so it, perhaps was there if 1954 you lost a shift. Right. Uh, do you remember what model you were making back then, 1954? Was it a Oldsmobile again? I believe it was the BOP model. BOP, of course, stands for Buick, Oldsmobile, and Pontiac. Pontiac. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so the the day-to-day -day relationship uh, at uh, making the the plant run, uh, keeping um, efficiency, and making sure the contract was abided by uh, the key personnel was the chairman of the shop committee and the labor relations director, correct? Uh, yeah. So you were there for 10 years in that position, uh -huh. and how many labor relations directors did you have to train? Two. Two. Uh huh. And so, uh, the five years each, or was it eight one and two another, or one longer? I believe it was uh, probably maybe seven 
and three. Yeah. Frank shot and and, and uh, I'll think of the other one. The other name. It was two. Yeah. And do you recall, uh, Herb, uh, if you had uh, any of the grievances that you wrote or aware of or approved as chairman of the shop committee that ever made it to the umpire from the Doraville plant? Yeah. Under the United Auto Workers a contract with General Motors, uh, there's a four-step grievance procedure, right. and the last step in that grievance procedure is for the grievance to go uh, to what is referred to as the umpire. In most collective bargaining agreements, it's described uh, as the arbitrator. And General Motors and the UAW have had a long series of permanent umpires uh, that have been some of the leading uh, uh, voices uh, in the field of labor relations. Right. Uh, Yale law professors, Harvard law professors, uh, uh, that the UAW and General Motors get nothing but the very top people in the field of labor relations to serve uh, as the umpire. Right. And so you, did, was there a case from Doraville that made it, uh, that went all the way up? Uh, to I'm, the umpire? I, I, they were some like Falcon. Let me ask you this, if I might hurt. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that there was a limited amount of time that a committeeman had to work on union business and adjust grievances. Then right. at some point, the UAW and General Motors entered into an agreement. Uh, that the committeeman would be a full-time committeeman. Do you remember when that was? Was it during your time as chairman of the shop committee? 54 to 64? I think it was full-time for a portion of us. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, the chairman. <clears throat> was full time, not for uh, the blanket all the way from committee. See, there's three, what, three types. The, the, uh, the dis district committee, the shop committee, and then the zone committee, and then the chairman of the committee four different types of commit. So I'm sure I say I'm sure that the chairman got full time before the other three. But I'm not sure just how each one came in, mm -hmm. you know. But it gradually I tell some of these committees now, <laughs> you don't know how fortunate you are. I said, used to, when I was having to run, I'd, I'd ask them to vote for me today. I'd get elected tomorrow. I had to start back again. <laughs> so. as chairman of the shop committee here at Local 10 for 10 years, between 1954 and 1964, and you were relating a story to me uh, about uh, your encouraging management uh, to adjust a job, uh, to put a pit in so that workers wouldn't have to stretch so much in uh, applying tires uh, to the cars. Can you Give us a little description of that effort. Yeah, 
over in the chassis department. We were running 60 jobs per hour. And the tires were mounted on wheels upstairs and they were coming down the chutes to be mounted on the car, on the frames. And the employee who was doing this job had to get at a stoop position to to do this particular job. So I was talking to management about some way this employee could stand up straight and push these wheels and have his wrench to tighten without being in a stoop position. You know, that's you can't do this hour after hour after hour and live to retire. But oh, they said he's got plenty of time. I said, we're not talking about time. We're talking about the position the man has to get in. So I suggested that they dig a pit like we have in some areas. Oh, they couldn't do that. <laughs> so I said, well, we may have to take a strike, though. So it rocked on a few weeks, and we did. We took a strike, though. And after taking this vote, we notified them, and after a week went by, they did recognize they could dig a pit, and they did this over a weekend. No one lost any time. The people can install the wheel and stand up straight, and we got the grievance settled. Well, that's <laughs> so a little leverage goes a long way in terms of encouraging management to adjust the job. It sure does. <laughs> <laughs> so you um, experienced uh, being a committeeman where your time was limited, uh, and you also experienced uh, being a full-time chairman of the shop committee. Uh, can you describe the experience uh, at General Motors Doraville in terms of the shop committeeman's ability to resolve grievances uh, at the lowest level possible, right at the shop floor level? Yes, you know, if your time is limited, you receive a call from someone that may be across uh, a, a good ways from where you work. And you have to go from your location to answer that call to the other location. You get signed in by the person that's calling you to solve a grievance and his foreman sign you in. And they're sensitive to the time. And you you have to be careful. You don't use too much time and you run out of time before the day is half over. So there's a great deal of, of time that you can use where there's unlimited time when the commitment has time to look things over and suggest uh, corrections to things that help solve problems. 
So it works both ways. So since we have unlimited time for chairman and other people in the plan, it's really helped management as well as it's helped committee. It works both ways. So the, the number of grievances uh, uh, in one facility in Georgia, uh, there are so many grievances that there are literally two grievances for every bargaining unit employee. Can you tell us uh, the number of grievances at the General Motors facility uh, in terms of the number and uh, has the committeeman's ability to solve problems kept those active grievances that even get to second step at a relatively small number? It's my understanding that the grievance load, as we use the term load, is very light since they have full time versus the time we had when I was committed. It makes a great difference. And I believe management will also tell you it makes a big difference. And it, it, it works. It works very well. It, you, you have time to even get better acquainted with management versus commitment or stewards, which if you want to call. So it, it, it's good to work this way. Mm -hmm. And your um, experience in coming to work at General Motors Doorville in 1949 was after the passage uh, of the Taft-Hartley amendments uh, to the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, and so you, as a union official, experienced uh, workers in Georgia having the option of joining the union or not joining the union and receiving the same negotiated wage level benefits and representation rights. Uh, how did you, as a UAW official, handle that challenge uh, to maintain uh, a high level of membership here at Local 10 in Doraville? Well, you know, most of the people who work in the GM plan at Doraville are sensitive to the fact that if you receive the benefit that the union uh, are able to receive, they want to be a part of it. And you explain to them when they begin work that we do have a union and the union will represent them and represent them well. And we would, uh, we explain the meeting times and then we would sure invite them to come to the union <clears throat> meetings and give them the dates and also tell them they would be sworn in if they come down and at the prescribed time. And we we don't want you to work in here without being recognized at, as one of us. Mm -hmm. So normally, not very often do we find people that want to accept the benefit and not be a part of the youth. It's my understanding that out of uh, over 3,000 uh, bargaining unit employees uh, 
at the Dorval plant uh, uh, that there are less than 30 uh, who choose not to belong to the Union. That's what I've been told, and I believe that's a very good number. And the Union people here have done a good job on letting the people know what the Union can do for uh, Herb Green, do you think that the fact that the UAW has a full-time committee then present at the plant and so that workers can see a union representative there representing their interests on a daily basis contributes to the high rate of membership for this UAW local in Georgia? I'm sure by having the time to explain and to work with management on getting the best uh, job done. It not only helps solve this job, it helps solve and sell cars. You know, uh, selling automobiles today is a real competitive business. And the more cars we can sell today, the better we can serve the people, the better we can get improvements and our friends' benefits as well as our wages. The Doraville Assembly Plant has a reputation uh, throughout the General Motors system as being a hard-working plant, that if you are going to be employed there, you are going to work uh, a full day. Uh, the plant has also uh, been cited for its uh, high level of labor management cooperation and uh, level of productivity. Uh, in your 50 plus years being associated with Local 10 and General Motors Doraville, uh, what do you attribute uh, uh, that reputation to? Well, we had a retirees meeting at uh, Local 10 yesterday and a report was given by the President chairman and president of Local 10, and both of these men expressed good reports on the quality and on the uh, report from General Motors uh, people from the report they give on both productivity and other measurements. I'm not sure just how they arrive at their way of measure things, but they gave good reports yesterday. And you know, I'm proud to be a retiree member of the local team. And I believe all of our over 3,000 members that's retired as well as the 3,000 that's working is proud to be a member and retire from GM at Dorothy. So, your career here, um, you left as chairman of the shop committee in 1964, is that correct? That's right. And you uh, were appointed as an international representative by the UAW, is that correct? That's correct. And so you left uh, uh, the 
environs of Doraville, Georgia, uh, having been born and grew up in Norcross and then working in Doraville, uh, you left uh, to go to the UAW uh, International Office and that was located where? In St. Bernard, Georgia on uh, Highway 285 just off of uh, 85, about, uh, I would say about a 15 minute drive from local 10, maybe 20 minutes, depending on traffic. <laughs> <laughs> so your promotion and appointment as an international representative, you left and on a journey of 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and you uh, took up the position as UAW International Rep in 1964. Yeah. And what were your uh, job duties there as a UAW International Rep? I was assigned to the Education and Political Action Department. And what were your your duties uh, as the international representative assigned to the Education and Political Action Department? I would meet with the local education uh, committee, each local union under the bylaws and constitution of the UAW it's required to have a education committee and a citizenship and political action committee. And my job was to meet with these committees and to explain and present my knowledge of what they should be doing to promote this or these committees. Both, both in and out. When I say in, I mean in the community where they live and in the political arena where they should be in life. In, in And who appointed you to international staff in 1964? Uh, well, it's the a, a regional director with the president's approval. President of the UAW. And the president in 1964 was Walter Ruther? Walter Ruther. And did you have the occasion to meet Walter Ruther? Oh, yes. And do you recall the first time you met Walter Ruther? Well, I had met Walter Ruther prior to going on the staff. I met him. In 1951, when I was a delegate to the National Con Convention. And Thirteen years later, uh, Ruther approved your appointment as an international representative. Yeah. And did you work, have the opportunity to work with Walter Ruther on different projects? Uh, 
UAW sponsored? Yes. When, when, when I was uh, chairman of the local 10 bargaining unit, we, uh, we had a, a unit attached to the skilled trades uh, unit. And it was only two, maybe three classes, classifications. One was uh, uh, cardboard bale, the other janitor sweeper. Those was the two classifications, but the classifications were attached to the skilled trades department. And those two classifications could not transfer to the production classifications, which were the classifications on the production lines assembling cars. <laughs> the reason for that, and probably you won't take this out, the reason for that was to keep the races segregated. Mm -hmm. I inherited this when I took over as chairman. When we had the layoff back in the 1954, we lost one full shift. I was told I was going to have to do away with these, this two classifications. And we were going to call people back with less seniority than some of the production workers that were classified as or uh, similar to, uh, as painters uh, uh, as uh, uh, other classifications that had less seniority than they had. And I said, I will, would not agree to that. Now, when we're all called back, then I will agree to do away with having these two classifications attached to the, the skill traits classification. And uh, we, we had a hard time getting this done. But eventually, that's the way it was done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, when I really stood my ground and held out for this, I didn't think at that time I'd ever be working full time for <laughs> the UAW. International. But Walter Luther didn't hold that against me and approved me to go to work for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I say, I don't know if you want to put that in. Well, that's fine, Herb, but uh, mm -hmm. what I'm getting out of that is that uh, um, you were going to uphold. Uh, 
the principle of seniority. Right. Uh, and that uh, Ruther is off quoted as saying that uh, seniority knows no race, seniority knows no gender, seniority rewards uh, the service you have provided. I, I said, look, you you going to tell me what you set up to, to, to be sacred? It was sacred when you had it and wasn't going to do it. And now you telling me I'm going to take this to the membership now and do no, not do it. I won't do it. <laughs> I, I mean, that was hard for me to do it. I tell you, I, I, was, I, I felt like a, 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 a Norfolk boy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the same principle of being honest uh, with uh, the top uh, leadership of the organization was the same principle that you adhered to and was recognized uh, by the plant manager here at Doraville yeah, right. when you left to go to the international staff. Can yeah. you tell us about that? <laughs> yeah, it, well, I, you know, there was time that there was people that wanted me to write a grievance that they were had overloaded jobs. And I knew that the job wouldn't because the, the whistle or the bell would ring and we, we had odd hours. 4.42 stop. The lines would stop. Some of these people, they wanted uh, had grievances that they had too much work would be standing there ready to punch their card when the, the bell would ring to stop. And I would say, you want to tell me to write you a grievance and you standing here waiting for the bell to stop? No, I'm not going to look like a fool and do I said, if I wrote that grievance tomorrow, it, it, it quit in time when you wait, the foreman's going to say, Green, come here. See that man? You, I'm not going to do that. So I, I kept getting elected by not doing it. And I, I felt I was doing the right thing. And the plant manager, at one point on your departure, had a ceremony mm -hmm. where he presented you with a cake right. in honor of uh, your dedication to representing workers' interests and uh, always being forthright and honest uh, That's right. as you represented workers. Yeah. So it, it works. It works. Not that I'm... Um, so high and mighty that, um, you know, but I do believe in telling the truth. <laughs> Our interview with Mr. Herb Green. Uh, this is Phil Laporte. I am the director of the Labor Studies Program at Georgia State, and I am conducting the interview. Uh, Mr. Herb Green is here with me again today. It is uh, Monday. Uh, January the 23rd, I believe, is the date, and we are going to uh, pick up with uh, Mr. Green's um, role uh, in the General Motors Doraville assembly plant, where he worked for 15 years, from 1949 to 1964. He was elected uh, as a first an alternate committeeman, and then as a committeeman. Uh, he served... Um, uh, in a variety of different uh, positions, culminating in being elected as the full-time chair of the shop committee for UAW Local 10, representing hourly workers at the Doraville assembly plant. Uh, so, Herb, uh, during those 15 years, uh, were you ever involved uh, in uh, collective bargaining negotiations? Oh, yeah. I was... 
involved most of the time during those years. Uh, we, we had some very good years production wise. I guess, uh, uh, I don't really guess, I know that uh, the, the line ran at full speed for, for over half of the years during this time. And a full speed being 60 jobs per hour. Uh, General Motors has um, national negotiations well, the national agreement that affects all General Motors employees, and then there are local negotiations, uh, local issues between the workers at a particular plant uh, and the management at that plant. Uh, were you involved uh, in national negotiations or at the local level with Local 10 here at Doraville? Most of my negotiations was locally, but on two occasions, I believe, I was, I was uh, involved on, at the time we, we secured a long term for five years. I believe that was in the late 50s or maybe early 60s. I'm not sure which. We got a five-year contract. And since I would, had been involved in local market with the national contract, they asked me to fill in some uh, and worked on the national, tying it in with the local. And do you recall any particular uh, issues that came up in those negotiations that are memorable, be it um, job content or speed of the line or the introduction of a new uh, benefit. Uh, you recall anything that really stands out in your mind that you were directly involved in? Yes. Uh, I don't know how this came about when we had the two or possibly three classifications mm -hmm. that was attached to the skilled trades department, but at one time during the 1954 layoff, we had uh, the layoff that affected production where it a production line seniority wise and management was uh, General Motors was saying it didn't affect the skilled trades nor these two or three classifications that had been attached that I inherited. And I said, well, you know, I just can't recommend this until we get all of the employees back. It certainly wouldn't be fair to bring back people with 
less seniority. And I'm just using this as an example. The ones that's got less seniority classified as uh, 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 janitor sweeper than a classification of the simpler and and use them and not not go by seniority. Now when all all employees plant wide on with these uh, two to three classifications are back, I'll recommend and agree to do away with these uh, uh, classifications that's been attached for all these years. So you are upholding uh, the principle of seniority. That's right. And safety and health has always been an issue uh, that has come up uh, both at national negotiations and at local negotiations. Uh, can you recall a, an issue regarding safety and health that you were involved in in local negotiations here in Doraville? Yes. We've had uh, several I'd say several, at least, I would say during my tenure there, four or five that was outstanding safety. And safety uh, issues were, were we, we used those or they were to be used as uh, emergency, uh, as strikeable issues it, it, at times when we didn't have to give the other uh, day notifications of how many days we had notified prior to strike such as something that was too physic physically uh, bad for people's health. Mm -hmm. We had maybe two to four that, uh, that stands out in my mind. Oh, I believe uh, one of those was when we had some real and heavy uh, deck lids, we called them. It was really trunks. Uh, and we, the feeder lines were, they required one, one person to handle the, the, the removing the deck from the feeder line, take them to the main line, and install them on the main automobile. So I fell and wrote, and eventually wrote a grievance uh, charging an overload and charge them with physical uh, 78 grievance. Mm -hmm. And we we settled that by them installing a hoist with a suction that was handled by a person. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you spent 15 years uh, in the Doraville plant. Uh, uh, beginning in 1949, and then you left to be uh, an international representative. You were appointed uh, as an international representative. Can you recall, Herb, uh, the gains that were made from the time you began here at Doraville uh, to the time you left to be an international rep, 
And then when you finally retired, uh, in terms of wages and the whole benefit package, uh, the health care plan, uh, the uh, supplemental unemployment benefits, uh, the pension program. Can you give us a little comparison of what it was like when you first were hired and then sort of halfway through your UAW career uh, when you became an international rep and then when you uh, did retire in the 1980s? Yes, when, when I first began in 1949, there was hardly any comparison uh, when I left to, as an international rep in the mid sixties, that being wages and the the time that the committee had to handle grievances plus the the lead way we had on making suggestions plus the the knowledge we were able to really obtain by having some extra time. We, we just learned also how to uh, work better with each other. And in my opinion, made much better working conditions. When I first went to work at General Motors, you were you you didn't have time to even speak to people on your way to take care of your personal needs. You just just about had to run there and back. If you pause, they, they wanted to give you a reprimand for wasting time and laundry. And this re really caused a lot of hardship and a lot of hard feelings. You, you was just about daresome to speak to people on, on your way to and from. And it's it's just like a different world in, in the plant now. Mm -hmm. You don't misunderstand me. You still have to put in a good day's work, but you at least have some time to stretch and speak and feel like you have some time to make suggestions. So you saw both the advent of uh, higher wages, uh, greater benefits, uh, uh, supplemental unemployment uh, benefits, uh, and Walter Ruther talked about uh, ensuring uh, that workers' wages and benefits uh, would be taken out of competition through pattern bargaining uh, so that automobile manufacturers would compete on the basis of uh, design and productivity uh, and efficiency. Can uh, you uh, address that concept and how you saw it uh, come into operation during your career? Yes, you know, speaking of the large deck lids, that was just one item that came about. We had the wheels that they had uh, employees that were in a stooped position putting these wheels on automobiles at 60 jobs per hour. And finally, we suggested and 
took a striped bow to get the pit uh, dug and installed to get get the people, the employees in a standing position. And so so big change in the paint, the way the paint was applied. We could, you know, apply the paint and uh, it was dry with the the uh, dryers right on the lines immediately and didn't cause any real health hazards. The the lead that was uh, controlled uh, on uh, in the body shop where it was used so frequent and uh, it was they they really checked that to make sure there wasn't any lead and through the in the employee's blood stream. So the living was another innovation sure. brought about. Sure was. This was brought brought about which when the cost of living cost so much and but this we got several increases per hour based on how much it cost for example a loaf of bread or a quart of milk so which was not based on what the union figures were but based on government figures, which was, we thought, was very fair. I believe the last cost of living that was brought about was something like 45 cents per hour. You, you, that has a huge cost of living improvement. Now, that don't mean that that's a real cost of living as such, because when you go to buy whatever you have to have, it's going to cost the employee that much. And thank goodness we were able to work this out. And so the negotiation of the cost of living adjustment in the collective bargaining agreement protected hourly workers against uh, their wages being eroded by inflation. That's true. When, you know, people back in 1949, they never heard of cost of living being a tax where you could get raises. This is something that, especially, you know, we, when I say we, I'm speaking of the committee of Local 10, we would have sub-meetings with other committees. I can remember going to uh, maybe New Jersey, they had a BOP plant, Buick Olds Department. They were having things there that the Doval management sure didn't tell me. Now, they've got this in New Jersey, and we want to give you this in Doval. But by ways of me and some the president of the local ten going to a subcommittee meeting, and I do remember uh, 
New Jersey, and I believe that was uh, one of the plants in, in California, and one in uh, Maryland was building the same type automobiles we were, but they had benefits that we didn't have because they had been organized a lot. So by us attending these meetings, it gave me as the chairman the knowledge to know this. I came back to Norville with this in mind. And this is the way we were able to make some progress. We, when I would find out they had, for example, had coveralls for extra dirty jobs, then I would request that we be furnished coveralls for the extra jobs at door. I, I certainly would let them know I felt the employees at Dor Dorville were just as good as the employees in New Jersey or in uh, Maryland or California. And eventually we were able to get those benefits. And cloth gloves. You know, when I went to work for General Motors, after a few months, I was promoted to metal finisher. And I had to buy two pairs of cotton gloves a, a month. Or no, I'm wrong there. It was two pair, three pair a month because we had to use those to feel the metal to find where the low spots were to get. So we were able to get the company to furnish those gloves. That was uh, like getting 30 cents a, <laughs> a month increase in my salary to get a pair of gloves a month furnished. Well, uh, then in 1964, um, you left uh, Local 10 and uh, accepted an appointment as an international representative and you were placed in charge of education and the political action committee for the UAW uh, office here in Smyrna, Georgia. And so you began um, 22 years as an international representative for the UAW. Yeah. And can you describe uh, a little bit about what your job duties were uh, in the area of education and political action as an international rep? Well, back in the 60s, they were very few UAW automobile local unions in Region A. So Region A, of which Local 10 was assigned to, was consisted of several states. It was Georgia, Florida, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, uh, 
Mayor uh, 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 A small part of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, about three or four counties. I think it's, uh, I believe that's all of them were. And those states uh, consisted of Region 8 region of the nine. UAW. Right. So I was assigned when when the new local union was organized, I was assigned to meet with these new elected officials and hold classes after, before, and after work because they wasn't any money. Uh, they had no treasure. Most of them, well, hardly any of them, at this time to pay any lost time. So I would meet with these people and uh, whatever time they would set to me and do what I could to teach them what I had learned in filing grievances and trying to get more people in their unit to join the union. I, I would tell them, that don't, you know, don't try to browbeat these people. Just tell the people that if you're going to get the benefits of what the union will provide, I'm sure you'll explain to the people they'll want to belong and pay their dues so they can be a, a part of it. Now, it's unfortunate we in the state of Georgia, along with most of the other states that's part of Region 8, it's unfortunate that we have the right to work laws that we can't make the people join the union. But most of the people, I would say, if you explain to them and you show them where the union is good, not only for the ones that belong now, but for everyone, I believe they will want to join. And the other thing, if you will be truthful with the people, if your commitment, and you explain to them, there's certain things you can do for them, and other things they may have that you can't do when you first organize. You have to gradually get this. I try to tell them what we had when I first was elected as an alternate commitment and as a commitment. I had very little time to serve without any restrictions of time. So you, you know, you, you look to the time when you can have, like they do in my plant now, have full time. For so you worked as, uh, in essence, an educator, uh, training uh, new committeemen, training new local union officers right. uh, about um, collective bargaining and labor law, effective grievance handling, 
And as you've described, uh, uh, internal organizing that um, in these right-to-work states in Region 8 of the UAW, most of them did pass state right-to-work laws where individual employees did not have to join the union or pay dues to the union as a condition of employment. However, they received the, the negotiated wage level, benefits, and representation rights uh, uh, that the union provided to all represented employees. Right. And I, I told them, and this, it, it works well with most people. You use the silent treatment. If you run across these people, it's so hard against you. You just get with the group and you don't talk to them. At lunchtime, you just kind of segregate. Let, let, stay away from them. You know, I tell you, when you do people that way for a while, they'll, they'll come around. People don't like to be shunned. People like to be wanted. They like to have friends. And I'm... <laughs> I've seen when I was in local 10, we would have a person that we just tried to get them to join and they, so we just kind of stay away from it. It wasn't long till he, he decided he'd better come home. Local 10 has had a record of being organized at 99.5, 99 99.9% of all eligible workers belong to the union. In fact, out of 3,200 members, uh, last count, there were approximately 25 employees uh, that did not belong to the union. That's true. And that was your experience in the time that you served as shop uh, committeeman, etc.? That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, like I said, it's uh, it's hard to work in there all day and people shunning it. You, you, you kind of say you're walking down the aisle and you're meeting someone and all of a sudden you take a shortcut. <laughs> They don't bring them around in most cases. Now, Mr. Green, your job as an international representative included uh, work um, as director of the Political Action Committee. And so the UAW CAP Council uh, required you to be involved in politics and legislative affairs, correct? Sure do. So if you could just recollect a, a few uh, of those uh, campaigns and some of the issues that you were involved in, um, Walter Ruther used to say that uh, what you got at the negotiating table could be taken away at the ballot box. Uh, uh, so help us out here in terms of a Georgia race. Uh, uh, I believe that you were involved in the support of a candidate that was running for labor commissioner in Georgia, and there was an incumbent by the name of Ben T. Hewitt, and he was yeah. being challenged by Sam Caldwell, is that correct? That's correct. We had uh, Ben T. Hewitt was commissioner of labor. We are very unique here in Georgia. Most of states appoint their commissioner. But correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you you probably know better than I do, but I believe it's only two, maybe three other states, they are the points they commissioner of labor. I mean, I mean, 
career yeah. I only won a few but uh, we decided since we elect a commissioner why can't we elect one that at least will be fair with BMTU have never met with us as to my knowledge as a group of labor people to really know what was on our mind. So Sam Caldwell, he was the personnel director for the state highway department. So I got to know him through a senator and I asked him if he would be uh, willing to run for commissioner. He was well liked. He was well, and they said they would. So, well, what year was this, Mr. Green? This was back in 1963, I believe that's right. And so, we decided the one thing that we really wanted to get past was we could get uh, our insurance, we call it insurance, was uh, unemployment insurance. If we could get a, 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 what I'm trying to say is a check stub from the state showing we got a, a unemployment for that downtime. You know, back then we were having a down at least one week, if not sometimes several months for model change. I can remember when my daddy worked for the Ford, Ford Company when they built Model T's on Ponce de Leon out there. And they'd be down maybe three or four months for model change. So when we would be down here at Local 10, we might be down for two weeks, might be a month, six weeks, and we couldn't get no uh, uh, SUV that supplement to your unemployment because we didn't get no unemployment. So we talked to Sam about running on that basis. We at least get a stub showing we stay entitled to it. So we was able to elect him. I, I still don't know just how we did it, but we did it. And I liked him. I really worked all I could and asked labor, and he, he really appreciated us doing that. So we had a governor, too, that was elected, Jim Carter, and he was going to help. I talked with him. Before, before we get Mr. Carter, if I uh, we could back up just a minute. So okay. it was a coalition uh, of different uh, labor unions uh, right. that supported Sam Caldwell. Uh, to be elected as labor commissioner of the state of Georgia. Right. All of AFL-CIO, the independent, like the Teamsters, UAW, and we would meet. I know some of the meetings was in people's homes. Charlie Mathias, I know, he was representing the steel workers and, and carpenters and was uh, uh, involved. And 
and uh, well, just all of labor. I I don't believe any labor supported Ben T. Hewitt. I, I can't remember it, but the end result, we elected Sam Caldwell. And Sam was really good to labor in doing what he could. Of course, like you said prior to electing the governor. Now, you can refresh my memory and correct me if I'm wrong here. I believe Carl Sanders was running during this time also. And I, for one, of course, we in Local 10 never did come out and support in the primary. We, we had our choice, but we didn't make it known in the primary who we were supporting. So, uh, Carl Sanders was a pretty good governor as far as labor was concerned. And I believe he didn't he be uh, who ran against well, Maddox? Was Maddox in the race with Sander, or was it Carver? Or was it Ernest Van Diver? I think it was Ernest. What? I believe. Uh, we can check on it, Herb. Uh, 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 Sam Caldwell was elected as Labor Commissioner, right. and uh, he has often said of uh, the support he received from Labor was key to be elected statewide, commented on the support from the communications workers of America, CWA, because they had right. a statewide presence. Right. It talked of the importance of uh, the building trades in IBEW 84, again, a statewide presence. And just the numbers uh, of the UAW was very helpful in his statewide race. And then, how long did Sam Caldwell hold the position as Labor Commissioner? Well, he held it until he, he really fouled up. Yes, sir. And he, he could have, I think he could have been good if he would have behaved himself. That's my opinion. He, he was elected statewide, I believe, five times, uh, yeah. holding, uh, holding the office of Labor Commissioner for 20 years. Right. And so once uh, he got elected to that position, Labor continuously supported him, mm -hmm. and he was elected statewide uh, for an additional four terms. Yeah. Now, did Commissioner Caldwell uh, take an interest in uh, nominating one Herb Green? to serve on the Unemployment Compensation Review Board? Yeah, he sure did. He, he asked me if I would be interested in serving. And the way they had this broken down, a three members on the board. One represents labor, one represents the public, and one represent management. Now, this is not, you know, uh, in spelled out in any form or any way, but it's known this is the way it's to be. So that's the way I've been since I've been on. I've always represented labor. We've got a black lady who represents management and a white lady, lawyer, that 
represents the public. And it it's worked pretty pretty well. The uh, the I I don't want this maybe how you can you were recommended by uh, Sam Caldwell to a governor of Georgia to be on the Unemployment Compensation Review Board. Uh, could you tell us who the governor was and give us a little background on it? Yeah. I, uh, I had made real close friends to Sam Caldwell, and he asked me, if I'd like to serve on the Board of Review of the Employment Security Act. And I said, well, if you feel I could do that, yes, I would. To, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, the regional director always told us, if you can get on some of these boards where you can be a, a important, important uh, voice, do that and serve on them. So he recommended me to the governor to be on this board. So I was out of town at that time, particular time. He called my wife and told her to have me to get in touch with him when I got back. So when I got back in town, I got in touch with Commissioner Caldwell. We went to the governor's office and we walked in for me to get sworn in. And this was Governor Maddox. Governor Maddox looked at me and he said, Her, I understood you was in that march from Selma to Montgomery. I said, Governor, I've never been to Selma in my life. So he swore me in as the labor representative on the Board of Review. And I've been on it ever since. I hope I've represented labor to the very best of my ability. I've tried. But you know, the Board of Review is just one way we can do things to help labor. And uh, Governor Carter, who had places that he uh, appointed people, and he appointed me to different places that was just on short term that uh, I was able to do. And I appreciate that. Speaking of Governor Maddox, he was in St. Joseph Hospital the last few weeks he lived. So I was over visiting R.L. Stevens. We called him Big Steve. He was in St. Joseph. And Steve says, you know who's in the hospital right down the hall? I said, no. He says, Governor Michaels. I said, well, I'm going to go down and speak to him. So I went down and spoke. And he said, Herb Green. And I said, yes. And I said, Governor, do you remember swearing me in? as a member of the board of review. He says, I sure do. I says, well, I'm still on that board. <laughs> and I 
I visited him. He didn't live too long after that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I understand it, you were never in Selma, Alabama. <laughs> However, a rumor has it that you went over to Alabama and joined the march led by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that ended in Montgomery in support of voting rights uh, uh, that, of course, had started in Selma uh, where Bull Connor sent the uh, state police and the dogs uh, to stop the marchers from coming over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But you didn't join the march until they were in... Montgomery. Some, I would say, approximately maybe a mile and a half or two miles outside Montgomery at a Catholic school. What we did, several UAW uh, personnel flew in to the Atlanta airport and we chartered the bus and rode the bus over to this Catholic school and then marched in with the group that came from Selma. I remember it very well. We uh, marched three abreast. I was in the middle we had, I can't remember the name of the lady that was on my left that marched, but she was a member or uh, one of the uh, members of the women's, women's team and uh, uh, Art Shy, who was the director of the education department, was on my right. And as we marched through this poor section, white section, these white people were pointing at us as we marched calling us ugly names, at which time Art broke ranks and said, I don't belong to this non-violent committee and I will tear your ass up. <laughs> and he scattered them out pretty much. So we, we uh, marched on and listen to the speech that Martin Luther King made from the capital of Alabama State House. Martin Luther King made on that day. But your statement to Governor Lester Maddox uh, that you had never been in Selma in your life was a true and accurate statement when you s said it to him. It sure was. <laughs> but I did join the group. And Region 8 was, was there and had been told to be there by Walter Ruther who was in the march at Washington when Martin Luther King made his speech in Washington a few years earlier. Yeah, Walter Luther uh, was providing financial support uh, to Dr. King uh, for the March on Washington and uh, you can see uh, his presence in the photographs uh, in the background when Dr. King is at the podium delivering his address. 
and the UAW provided assistance with uh, transportation and uh, marshals uh, for that event. Yes, right. sure. So uh, you had some interactions uh, in politics in Georgia, uh, and you also were instrumental, as I understand it, in supporting a young state senator uh, from Plains, Georgia, uh, who sought to be governor of the state. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, you know, I've, I've always been a people's person. I like to be with people. And I grew up, as stated before, during the Depression and was very limited on finances during that time and didn't really get to know politicians. Back back in them days, uh, I guess the first politician I can remember, really remember, was Franklin Roosevelt. And I can remember so well people talking about Franklin Roosevelt being a godsend to poor people. And I really believe that. You know, so many times I've wondered what maybe we were going to do for clothes during the Depression. And we, we found out that uh, they had been programs set up through the CCC camps and different things that would help people. And from that time on through the times of today when we have things like food stamps, med Medicare, Medicaid, uh, things for older people. It's just a godsend. And any time you can see help being given. It's help that the Democrats have been able to start. Maybe they haven't done everything that needed to be done, but it's been a start. When you look back and see just some of these walls, these rock walls around, over around Mayor Edna. They some I notice when I go, I used to go through there going out to Alabama where my, my wife grew up. We, we have to take her back home about once a month and I go through a area where the WPA were, and they some of the work that they did was still there, and it was noticeable. You could see those walls that they built back then, and that that has been built on, but. During the time that Jimmy Carter was governor, I got to know him real well. And during this time, I was able to introduce him to uh, Leonard Woodcock, you know, Walter Ruther and his wife was killed in a plane crash flying into Black Lake, Michigan 
where we have a, a beautiful place there where we have some time that's set aside each year where we can take young commitment and officers of unions in there for some training. But Walter Ruther and his wife and some people on the plane were killed flying in there. Well, Leonard Woodcock, who was the director of the uh, General Motors Department, was able to take over for the leadership and the president uh, from Walter Ruth and did a, a real good job, I think, at that time. In fact, he was appointed as the ambassador to China during the Jimmy Carter press. But I heard that uh, Jimmy Carter was going to be in Florida, and I knew that uh, Leonard Woodcock, our president, that had been elected president, was going to be there visiting our retiree, and I was able to get them together at St. Petersburg to meet. And I was very proud that the meeting came about and worked as well as it did. And uh, I, I believe that uh, if uh, Leonard Woodcock had had the power to uh, endorse at the time he got to know Leonard, I mean Carter, at that time, he would have probably endorsed him then. But later, he did recommend that the UAW endorse Jimmy Carter for president. And One, Florida. Jimmy Carter came to your door right. barefoot uh, while you were down there in Florida and to announce to, to you uh, that they had won the Florida primary. Right. So how did you uh, first become associated uh, with Jimmy Carter? How did you first come to know Jimmy Carter? Well, it's a state he was a state senator, and I was the, the cap and education. And, the, you know, we was trying to get the uh, waiting week and getting the, uh, s some improvement on the, the uh, Workman's comp, and I, I talked, and he was always willing to listen to me. I don't know why, but something about he and I, we just kind of drew us together. The last week he was good. He called the Atlanta office and said, Herb, if you've got time, you come down to the office. And I said, Governor, when you call, i got time to do whatever you want done. So I went right on. 
I didn't know what in the world he wanted. I walked in his office, he said, he looked at me, he said, what kind of governor do you think I am? I said, well, governor, you've been a good, fair governor. You didn't do everything I wanted you to do. If you had some of it, I guess could have been wrong. But you, you at least listened to it. And if we talked on the, he said, I'm going to seek the nomination for president, a Democrat president. What do you think about that? My God. I like swallowed my tongue. <laughs> I thought he'd gone crazy. <laughs> I really did. I said, well, you know, I told him, I said, I didn't support you when you first ran. I supported Carl Sanders, and I did. But I said, now, I'll do what I can. But I said, you know, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't hold no position on recommending who we support for president or recommend. But I'll, I'll do what I can. And I did. I recommended to Leonard that we, I said, now, I said, where can you show me that you don't have a way we go count? I told him with Leonard. And Leonard really fell in love with Jim. Mm -hmm. he, he really liked him. Well, Doug Frazier has uh, recalled uh, that when Jimmy Carter was running for the nomination, to, for the Democratic nomination for president, he said it was old Herb Green down in Georgia who told us he'd be okay. I know him. You can depend on him. <laughs> Herb Green was right there uh, supporting his home state governor. Uh, so Doug Frazier recalls that very fondly. I did. And I, well, to tell you the truth, I thought uh, uh, Ted Kennedy he he didn't want he didn't want Carter to have at all, and he was trying to get <laughs> get other people to support him, and you know, and get Carter on that second. In fact, I got I was able to go against. Uh, a lot of the UAW on the can of the, the uh, uh, Kennedy and got a bus load to go to the White House and, and Carter met us all, shook hands with us and, and uh, Carter was, was really uh, Mike, who was the director, he was telling uh, uh, Woodcock that, look, we going to support Carter now. You, you know, he was getting pretty all up with, with, uh, with uh, Woodcock if, if he pulled out and went to uh, Kennedy. Of course, in 1976, Jimmy Carter was the nominee of the Democratic Party and defeated Gerald right. Ford, uh, who was the incumbent unelected right. president. And then in 1980, Jimmy Carter's fortunes uh, suffered, uh, right. and uh, Ted Kennedy challenged him in the Democratic uh, primaries for the nomination of the party. Uh, in 1980, President Carter, the un incumbent, Democratic president uh, prevailed uh, over Ted Kennedy, but it turned out to be a fairly close race. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Carter, of course, uh, went on to lose uh, in the general election to Ronald Reagan in 
in 1980. You know what really hurt Carter more than it was? It was uh, his, all of his people that he took with him up there. Hamilton Jordan was the main reason. Tip O'Neill hated Hamilton. Hamilton, he was a good friend of mine. I couldn't, but Hamilton, he, he hated Tip and Tip hated him. Hamilton wouldn't return a call to Tip O'Neill and Tip and Tip Kennedy, you know, they were, oh shit. But Carter, people that was loyal to Carter, Carter wasn't going, wasn't going to do nothing to him. He was going to keep him. He kept uh, Hamilton right through thick and thick. Hamilton Jordan uh, fired Tip O'Neill's uh, close friend, uh, who was director of the General Services Administration. He did so without advising the Speaker of the House, uh, nor would he explain to the Speaker of the House what he had done and why he had done it. Uh, and so when you have uh, the Speaker of the House representatives, a member of your own party, it is not wise uh, uh, to take such an action. Uh, so uh, there's lots of uh, evidence of, of that rift uh, between the Carter White House uh, and uh, uh, Tip O'Neill and the Kennedys. Yes. So you were um, involved, very much so, when President Kennedy was elected. and. Um, did the president invite you to the White House? Uh, did you have the occasion to fly on Air Force One? Some of those uh, experiences? Yeah, I tell you, it, it, you know, <clears throat> let me get my thoughts together here a little. Uh, you know, I never dream I could do some of the things I did feel. First of all, he had been elected and I, I felt I wanted to talk to him before he went to Washington. I'm backing up some here, but so I called and told him I'd like to go to planes. This was, you know, you you get elected in November, and you don't take office till January. So this was sometime in latter part of November. He'd been elected the first part. So I arranged for my wife and I to go to the Plains. So have you ever been to his home at Plains? You know, he's got this little ranch type home. So we had to go to, Mon uh, to Americas to start with, and they cleared us. And we went on to the Plains. Went up to drive and, and went to the door and he, we we were dressed all in our best. And he came to the door with his turtleneck sweater on, on blue jeans. That come on in, Herb. And went in. He had the chair. So he said, "All right, Herb, it's your time." My wife and I said, he said, it's your time. So I said, well, Mr. President-to-be, I want to thank you for this time. He said, you thanking me? I should be thanking you. 
you gave me a lot more time than I'm giving you. This is the word to you. He did not say that. He, he was afflicted. <laughs> I said, well, I don't want to take much to get time. I figured when you got to Washington, you're going to be a busy man, and I won't get to see you all. He said, Hurt, as much as you done to me, you, you'll get to see me. So <clears throat> we talked to him, and, and he told me the main thing he was going to try to do was balance the budget. I said, well, keep in mind now how to balance that budget. Let's don't do it on the common people that we talked about. Them. So we didn't stay too long. I told him we did. So we we left, and the next thing he was pressed up, you know, I went to the inauguration. Took my grandson. I only had one grandson. So he was old, 17 years old. So I got him excused from school to go with me. We rode the train and, and uh, we uh, ran out the car. So he he was the chauffeur up there and he, he really enjoyed that. And of course I did too, you know. Sam, Sam uh, the senator. Sam Nunn. Sam Nunn, <laughs> I couldn't think of it. He showed us a good time too. That, Sam, he never did much or anything for labor. But Sam always liked me and he liked, he liked Sam uh, Commissioner of Labor. Sam Caldwell. Uh, he liked Sam. And he he do things for him. So he really did, he invited me to all his functions in Ram. So, so that was good. the next thing I knew. He was calling me from from Camp uh, David up there. He said him and his wife was there, and they was thinking about things t to be thankful. Call me on Thanksgiving. We just hear thinking about things to be thankful for. And you came to, to our mind. Well, it, you know, that kind of makes you angry. So I said, well, I sure appreciate you calling me. And I'm thankful that you thought about me. But uh, I appreciate it so much. So that's a kind of... Uh, 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 what a word I want to use. That's the kind of fellowship I've had with it, or had with it, from the time I joined the Peanut Brigade and all the way through. It's just been real enjoyable. I've done one good. I haven't tried to impose things on him or ask him to do things that I felt was selfish, but uh, I believe he if uh, he could help me if I really need help personally, he would do it. I believe he would do that much. But so uh, you went from hitchhiking, riding the streetcar, and hitchhiking home from Fort McPherson yeah. to getting a ride from the President of the United States on Air Force One. Yeah. 
Can you tell us about the occasion where you had the opportunity to ride on Air Force One? Yeah, I was in Washington. We was having a CAP conference, and we we'd always go up a day or two ahead. And this was when Martin Luther King Day too. And he was going to be the keynote speaker as president, keynote or one of the speakers. Something. So I wanted to hear the speech. And I was just kind of off that time. So Philip Wise, who was his appointment secretary, was in Washington and I called him I said Philip how about get me on Air Force One to go to Atlanta to hear uh, President Carter speak at uh, uh, Martin Luther King he said man you don't mind asking for big things didn't you I said did you mind asking me to go to Connecticut when I had some UAW people to? He said, no, oh, I guess I didn't. I said, look, Phil, you can either get me or own or you can't. It's that simple. He said, where are you going to be? And I gave him a phone call. He said, if I can get you on there, I'll call. So about an hour he called. He said, I got you on. You meet there in a certain place and, and they'll tell you what to do. I didn't know what to expect you. So I got there. I was going to be there with the, the, the staff and the, the, the People that write takes all of them. So we took off and we, once we got airborne, got up, he came in and I was back there with Elliot Levita was uh, on the fly and uh, Chip Carter, he was on. Elliot Levitis, of course, the congressman from the 4th District Fourth of Georgia. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the reporters, the writers, the papers. So, in a little bit, Jimmy came in. He said, when we get the airborne, I'll come in and talk to you. So he came in. He talked a while. And we was kind of little rough. He says, now, when we land, is a group supposed to meet us at Dobbins, and then the motorcade will take us on, and we'll have lunch. We're having lunch at the, the uh, there on Piedmont at the dugout. Uh, I forget the what's one of the ball players. So we ate there, then went on to the Ebenezer Church and he spoke. Well, Talmadge was in already down here. Senator Herman Talmadge yeah, of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Right. So he flew back with us. And this was when he was doing a lot of drinking. <laughs> and they had, the bar was open on the plane, and he was drinking and drinking. Before we landed, he done got pretty drunk. And Herman asked me, said, Herman, how about you driving me home? And oh, I said, well, I ain't got much time, but I'll drive you. <laughs> so I did. He told me, 
where to go. So, you know me, chewing this tobacco, I drove it. But I've got them, I think I showed you, that I showed you the picture he was telling me, how he was going to balance the budget and everything carbon. So, and Chip took those pictures. But uh, Carter told me, he said, I'll be be in touch with you. And then Amy was on there. I talked with her. And Rosalind, I got a picture with her. So it was there, like you said, I had to eat cornbread for breakfast. Didn't have no money to buy a flower. I'm riding on Air Force One, talking to the president about balance the books. Where can you do that? The United Auto Workers have always focused on developing leaders and providing opportunities uh, for their members uh, to become leaders, to be elected to office, to represent their fellow workers, to participate in education programs, to participate in public dialogue, uh, and to develop leaders. Where else but in the labor movement uh, and the UAW uh, would it provide an opportunity for a wage earner, uh, for an assembler, uh, to go from being uh, someone earning a wage to being an advisor to the leader of the free world. Turn her up. I tell you. You know, Philip, I've always been a tender heart person. I cried nothing. My mother, she She'd watch a program and cry. My daddy, even though he drank, but he he talked to me about the supply, and they'd cry, cry like a baby. So I I got a double dose, <laughs> and. I meant to bring this uh, this uh, reporter called me. I don't remember the year, but I want I want you to see it. I wouldn't mind getting it in. Here. Maybe we can get back together some. You know. My life has been. My family, my God, my the Democrat Party, and my my church has been a big part, and that that that's been me, and I I I, I don't know. Why I Carter thought enough of me to offer to call me and ask me what kind of governor he'd be. I don't know. But I thank God he did. I, because I sure am no super duper. You know. In fact, I finished high school through a correspondence course. And uh, I just, uh, right now I'm at 84 years old. I don't, as long as I'm sitting, I don't have any real pain. I have some physical pain sitting down, 
but I can't stand and well, but God has blessed me with fairly good health. I had bypass surgery. I had a real bad aneurysm when I was in the operating room six hours with that and had knee surgery. I got a wonderful family. Just so much to live for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I never dreamed that you would do this for me. But I'm happy that you have. I believe that it might help somebody that might read about this. I don't know that it will. But when we look at that question as to your role as an educator, and your role uh, as a UAW leader, and then through teaching and through political involvement uh, to spread the message uh, of opportunity for workers, decent treatment for workers, uh, a better American society, and uh, the effort that it takes to understand issues, understand policies, and then to get involved uh, to make sure uh, that we have the best society possible. And Herb, I want to ask you uh, about uh, some of those efforts. You were instrumental in the Region 8 summer school for over 20 years. And you began that summer school at Black Mountain, North Carolina? Yeah. And as I understand, there was no air conditioning. No. <laughs> there were simple classrooms. Yeah. Uh, everybody had to help w with every effort that was made. But you brought people in uh, and, and gave them information so that they could take back uh, and create a better life for the people that they represented and worked with. Yeah. And yet, Give us a little background on old Black Mountain. Yeah, well, Black Mountain, like you said, was just, it was just a roof over our heads and just a, a pretty hard bump to sleep on. But we, we never fail to open up our class with a prayer. We we always knew where we came from. And we we really hoped and prayed where we were going. And as Walter Griffin used to say, if you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going. And uh, I used to try to get some of the better people, I thought, to come to our summer schools. Mm -hmm. And Claude Pepper, for example. And I was going through, I don't know what I'm going to do with all the things I've accumulated over the years, mm -hmm. my wife and I talk about things that we got now. What we going to do with this now that we we can't have too many more years? What we going to do with it? You moved the Region 8 Summer School from Black Mountain, North Carolina to the campus of the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Right. And you and at the University of Tennessee, uh, you arranged uh, for Senator Claude Pepper, of course he was in the House of Representatives uh, from Florida, to be one of the speakers. Uh, okay, do you uh, recall that particular session with the retirees and the whole summer school group when Claude Pepper spoke? Yeah. I happened to be in the audience uh, at that event and for the retirees, it was as if uh, a superstar 
had come in. They all wanted to have their picture taken with Claude Pepper. They hung on his every word, and he told those people to stay involved, to stay engaged, that we need to hear your voice, we need your energy, we need your wisdom as we debate public policy issues. Right. And, and Herb Green, during that same session, uh, you arranged for the governor of Tennessee, Ned McWhorter, right. to come and to address the summer school. Right. How is it uh, that this UAW Region 8 uh, education director was able to get the United States congressman, the governor of the state, to get such high-ranking public officials to come and speak to the students at the UAW summer schools? Well, I think it's because I stayed in touch with them. Let them know that we depend on them to come and, and, and share with us their knowledge. That they, they not only was, you know, doing us a favor, but we could help them. You know, they worked both ways. And they were, it was, I was, Claude Pepper invited me. I was in Washington. He was there for some time. Calls, I don't remember what, but the night that my mother died, I was in Washington and he invited me to go with him to make a speech. I can't remember to who or what, but when I got back, they was trying to get in touch with me to let me know, I'll tell you, when we moved back to my grandparents, we moved in with not only my grandparents, we moved in with an old mate aunt. My old mate aunt and my mother both died the same night. Mm -hmm. So my wife called me. She told me by, about my our left word that my old maid aunt had died, but she didn't tell me my mother had died too for me to come home. So that's where I was. I'd gone to be with Congressman Pepper. And I had a double funeral at my church for this old maid aunt and my mother. The old maid aunt was like a second mother to stay. She was so afraid of bad clouds that had wind. She'd get us children up. We'd come up a bad cloud and I, she'd get us up, have us pull our, put our clothes on. She'd say, if we get blown away, we going to be dressed. <laughs> she believed yeah, it. Yeah. Well, another um, candidate for public office uh, was in the 4th Congressional District in Georgia. And he credits uh, you with giving him uh, invaluable advice and giving him the courage uh, after uh, losing the first time he ran for office to continue on and I'm talking about the Democratic congressman from the 4th District, Ben Jones. He said that Herb Green uh, was uh, his best advisor and taught him more about running for elected office and relating to the electorate than anyone else. you recall that campaign with Ben Jones? I uh, sure do. Yeah, he came, you know, he, he was on uh, this uh, 
show of uh, the Dukes of Duke Hazard. Hazard. He was the, the the jolly man. He was the mechanic, Cooter. Right, and he came to University of Tennessee, and we had him Cooter. All of them called him Cooter in there, and uh, he, I, I honestly believe that helped him get elected to that office. And I, I believe if he had kept going the way he started, he could have made a good Congress and kept. Somehow he got off on the wrong, wrong track here recently, I think. I don't know why. Well, they changed the congressional district boundaries, yeah. and he left his fourth congressional district of DeKalb yeah. County, right. and then ran in another district uh, that was primarily Athens and Clark County, and many of the people in that district didn't know who Congressman Ben Jones was. Yeah, that's true. And he eventually was defeated. and. Of course, left the Congress. Yeah. Yeah. He went back to Carolina, didn't he? Uh, didn't he back there now? I actually moved to Virginia. Virginia. Yeah. 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 So. But you have been a member of the Gwinnett County Democratic Party uh, for how long, Mr. Green? Well, it's over 50, I'd say 53 years. So 53 years, a member of your church, a member of the Democratic Party in Gwinnett County, and a member of Local 10 of the UAW. Right. And then in 1986, you retired uh, from the UAW as an international representative. And then you began another phase of your association with the UAW as a member of the retirees chapter. Right. And so you've never left the UAW, is that correct? No, I haven't left it. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, these past almost 20 years now uh, that you have been a member of the UAW retirees chapter? Well, we are. Uh, the, the chapter is meets once a month with the exception of in, in December. And the reason for that, we have a care and share program in December that we raise money to help people that wouldn't be helped otherwise. So we, we, uh, we have a, a meeting with where we have all of the members that retire are invited and they have sworn in to be a sworn in retire a member. <clears throat> if they want to make a short little talk they've given that privilege to do. Plus, the local will serve a sandwich and uh, a soft drink and some potato chips. Normally, they've been, I think they started about six months ago, a serve a regular meal about four times a year. Uh, like, uh, well, Christmas and New Year. It's four pretty uh, good chicken dressing and things of this type. And then the retirees have different functions that they vote to send people to go to see 
what other retired workers are doing. And the UAW has a retirees department that the uh, local 10 is involved in. I would like to be involved, but I just can't walk well enough to go from, you know, if you go and you housed maybe in one hotel and you meeting or the group that you affiliated with are meeting somewhere else and you have to do quite a bit of walking. I'm just not physically able now to walk there. I'm, I believe I'm able to, to do most anything, uh, you know, uh, sit, but uh, I just can't walk too well. So at 84 years old, uh, you continue to participate in the Retirees Club, continue to participate in the Gwinnett County Democratic Party, continue to work the phones right. on behalf of candidates that you support, and you are here today at UAW Local 10 uh, trying to help the local and help the UAW with uh, keeping this Doraville assembly plant open. And as I understand it, uh, Herb Green is uh, going to make some calls uh, to public officials who you have a relationship with to seek their support and assistance to getting General Motors to keep this plant uh, open for as long as you possibly can. Yes, I have a call in now for Philip Wise, who I mentioned earlier, he was the appointment secretary. He works for the Carter Center. Now, I called him. He's returned my call twice, and I've, I've been away from the phone. I've called Andrew Young, ambassador. I want to talk to him about keeping the plant open, and I have a call for President Carter. I believe if President Carter would get involved, you know, he's uh, involved with a lot of the foreign uh, uh, places, uh, health-wise, getting health, uh, help for health people, I believe he might have some influence if he would give it. I'm going to ask him to. Well, Herb, thank you very much for speaking with us. I think we're going to end it right there.